Yep, my name is Joseph Shea. I'm the Skagit County Noxious Weed Coordinator. Um, I've been in this position since 2015, or no, 17, and then I was seasonal um, noxious weed worker for two years before that. Um, I grew up in Skagit County most of my life. Our family moved over from Prosser, Washington, and we established a beef farm out here. We grow a key Angus beef, and so I always kind of grew up in the agricultural environment and uh, went to college. I got my bachelor's in environmental conservation and um, got some other certificates as well. Uh, but I kind of just ended up on a pathway dealing with noxious weeds. And so um, we work with plants all over the county. Um, and so, slide. Ooh, there we go. Um, so we work with weeds all over the county. Um, we currently, you know, we deal with noxious weeds. You see the picture on the top left there. It's an airboat. We work with WSDA for Spartina Anglica out in the Tidelands. And then we also work with like Japanese knotweed uh, on the ri river systems. And so that's a picture of us on the right there, loading up our four wheelers, getting ready to go spray some riparian areas there for uh, the rivers. Um, we are, uh, we do have a board. Uh, we have some members of the public. And so this is my way to sell the program to you guys. But uh, we have representatives that help kind of give our program some uh, um, guidance, but they're also in charge of um, deciding the noxious weeds, uh, the noxious weed list in our county, which is actually has some legal ramifications. Uh, but we are looking for board members in weed district three. And so that's that area there, uh, kind of between Cedrioli and Birdsview. Additionally, we're looking for someone for District 4 as well. And so that's kind of uh, north of Skagit River between Birdsview um, and just past Marble Mount. So if any of you guys are interested, if you live in those zones, just feel free to reach out to me and we'd love to have you on the board, especially if you care about plants and how they affect our kind of agricultural community. So you may be wondering uh, to yourself, there's actually a job uh, for noxious weeds. Um, it's kind of a very niche market, but there is actually um, state laws. And so RCW 1710, uh, it's a rice code Washington. So essentially that just outlines all the rules and regulations of noxious weed boards in the state. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, it establishes the law essentially stating that all landowners are responsible to control the noxious weeds on their property and prevent them from spreading to adjacent property owners. Um, this originally was instituted um, in our state or at least in our county in 1980. Uh, I think it was sometime in the 60s for the state. Uh, but in our county, our biggest concern was Canada thistle back then with our pea industry, so pea crops. Um, a large concern was that the the crop was blowing into pea fields and essentially making them unsellable, um, which was a big economic burden. And um, that kind of initiated our board and um, the work we do today. Now, although Canada thistles got a little bit away from us, also our industry has changed a little bit. And so there's kind of some different priorities now than what there used to be in the 80s. Uh, WAC chapter 16750. And so this is where we keep the list of all the monetary fees and penalties, but it's also where we outline all the noxious weeds in the state. Um, so class A, class B, class C, um, and that's kind of dictated down to us from the state. And then from that list, we can choose additional species that aren't currently selected. Um, but that just outlines the schedule monetary penalties because myself, I technically am an enforcement officer. Um, and so I can't go and write tickets, although it's extremely rare because that's not a great way to inspire good landowner interaction. Uh, we really just try to give them all the tools that they need as a landowner um, to uh, take care of their weeds. And then additionally, uh, we have WAC uh, chapter 16752, and this is just the quarantine list. Um, and so essentially any noxious weed species, or at least most of them, um, you're not allowed to transfer, sell, or um, you know, any, any sort of way transport those uh, across county lines or uh, around the state. Um, this largely refers to nurseries. And so obviously every plant we put on this noxious weed list could potentially affect an uh, you know, a business's, you know, bottom line because, you know, maybe the plant is very popular. Uh, you know, like a good example would be like butterfly bush. And so anytime we do list a plant, we do have to take those economic impact statements and, and it kind of ends up getting nestled here as far as what uh, nurseries are allowed to sell and uh, distribute. Okay. 
And feel free while I'm going along, um, if you have any questions, you know, you throw them up in the chat box or just unmute and just uh, chime in. That's totally okay with me. Um, just helps out with the fluidity of the conversation. So, but um, I'll start talking about the IPM. I'm sure some of you have heard about integrated pest management or at least uh, maybe best management practices, it's very similar. Um, and so a lot of people are concerned about um, the long-term control of noxious weeds. And so we try to implement integrated pest management. And so what that means is we don't want to go out to a site or a property every single year and spray chemicals every year and not get anywhere. Although chemicals can be very effective as a tool for treating some noxious weeds, a long-term success isn't dictated it shouldn't be dictated by how much spray you're using. And so what we try to do is implement multiple strategies. So whether it's mechanical, cultural, uh, chemical, biological, to create a long-term treatment plan. Um, and so that means maybe you do an uh, initial chemical treatment, then you follow it up with some polling because now you've got the population to a manageable level. And then maybe past that, you start integrating in the desired species, whether it's tree plantings or, or if it's in a garden environment or an agricultural environment. So that's something we really try to implement because it's not very uh, cost effective to do the same thing over and over and over again every year. Um, and it kind of feels like you're chasing your tail. So that's just essentially what we try to implement across the board. So when you're thinking about developing integrated pest management, you really have to chart, start to understand what, what plants you're dealing with and how to get rid of them. And I think one of the most important things to start noticing is the weed life cycle. And it's just like any other plant you're trying to, to grow, there's specific times in the year where it's more susceptible to control, or maybe in general, um, you know, it produces seed at a certain time. And so really understanding what plant you're dealing with, how it reproduces can really help your effectiveness. So a lot of times, let's say thistles, things like that um, are biennials. And so those are two year life cycles. So typically it'll come up the first year in a rosette stage. So it's close to the ground, uh, maybe sprawling across the ground, uh, but it really doesn't have any upward growing plant material. And so it can make it very hard to see. And so, so that's why it's super important to be always uh, monitoring your properties, whether it's agricultural fields, forest lands, riparian areas, even your backyard. If you're not actively monitoring it, odds are you're going to miss the stage of the plant and that's the easiest time to control it. <clears throat> uh, typically biennials will spread by seed. There are some runners and stuff like that uh, sometimes associated. Uh, but yeah, rosettes first year and sometimes you have to also remember uh, they can act as a different type of growth cycle. So a lot of these noxious weed species we deal with, they come from other places and they have maybe a more stabilized growth habit. But when they come over here, um, they can almost act like a annual or a perennial um, and they can kind of grow in a different manner than they would in their native range. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just, you know, like those being talked about a little bit earlier with soil, uh, moisture content, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, predators is also a huge thing because a lot of these plants don't have any uh, native predators uh, in our region because the native predators for that plant are on the other side of the ocean. So a good example for that would be like bull thistle. And so it's a little picture there. And so we all see it when it's that pink, beautiful flower sticking up with all of its thorns, but a lot of times we miss it when it's just in the rosette stage. So annuals, annuals are gonna be the easiest ones to get rid of. And so I got a picture there of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of a policeman's helmet. And so this is really simple annual to control. And all you have to do is either pull it out or mow it before it seeds and you can actively control it if you continue that over time. Um, lots of times they're very prolific seed producers because they, they rely heavily on that one year's seed growth to uh, um, be successful. Um, and then sometimes, you know, summer or wintering seeding. And then we get to the crux of the problem, which is perennials. And so this is, these are the plants that you're typically, at a large scale especially, you're probably going to have to take at least, or at least look at a chemical approach. Um, so, you know, multiple year life cycle, or it grows continuously, it's the hardest to con diff control, uh, spreads by root fragments, tubers, etc. And the best example of that that I can give you is probably Japanese knotweed, bohemian knotweed, or just the knotweed species in general. And so they fragment and they grow new plants. They grow all year long, even if they're not growing above the ground. Um, and they're just very prolific. Um, 
and they're very hard to get rid of. And so a lot of times you can't just pull that out and get rid of it, especially in large amounts. And so maybe you do have to take that chemical approach for that first year and then maybe take some other approaches the following treatment cycles. All right, so I kind of mentioned some of these a little bit. And I'll give you a couple examples. So most of the time when we're talking about control methods, these are the four tools that we have in our toolbox. So first off, we have chemical control. And so that's just some pictures of us along the river, out in the Tidelands, treating the Spartina, and you know, backpack sprayers, hand sprayers. Um, a lot of times, this is really when you're at a high scale event or high scale property where uh, you know, you're dealing with acres and acres and it's not very feasible for your you know, average show, no pun intended, to check go out there and control it. Um, now, after we do control, let's see that, that left picture on cultural patrol, you know, you want to come in and maybe plant some trees. And the goal there is to establish the desired vegetation so that way there's no bare ground that can be colonized by these noxious weed species. Um, another example would be uh, natural disturbance regimes. So it's not as applicable for us, but you know, down in Olympia, they're pursuing this a lot more in places in eastern Washington, uh, Idaho, Montana, more dry, arid areas. You know, adding a disturbance regime allows it, so you get those uh, um, annual flowers coming up in these grass fields, annual grass species, because a lot of them, if there's not a lot of uh, fuel on the ground, it just burns off the top layer and then they can regrow and reflourish. Um, and that potentially could be a, a good example of cultural control. Um, mechanical control. So I'm not sure how many of you are big farmers, but it's great having equipment to do all the work for you. But sometimes you just have a little tiny plot and you don't have the equipment. And so, you know, you had to pull out the portable, uh, what we call it, the portable heater is a shovel. But um, we also have an example of a weed wrench there. And so that's really good for pulling out um, butterfly bush, scotch broom, things like that. Um, but that's a good, just a good example of mechanical controls. And then lastly, we have biological controls. Um, and so these are really, really effective on areas that you just don't quite have a plan yet, but you just wanna slow down their seed production or just generally slow down the plant's reproductive ability. And so sometimes there's <clears throat> seed boring weevils, um, root boring weevils, there's moths that'll come and eat flowers, uh, plant eggs inside the, the, the cambrium. There's all sorts of bugs around there for all sorts of different types of plants. Um, but a lot of times this is gonna be used in areas that you can't quite get to, maybe you just want to knock back the populations. Um, but they're generally speaking, when you're dealing with biocontrol, you're dealing with a carrying capacity curve. And so what that means is you have a large population of this noxious feed, you release, you know, 500,000, a couple thousand uh, bugs, which sounds like a lot, but it's just one little, one little box. But nonetheless, they'll uh, knock back that plant, stunt its growth, but then all of a sudden you have a less abundance of that plant, so therefore the population of the insect will crash with it. And so it's just really good for especially people, you know, getting introduced to noxious weed control, maybe if they're hesitant that with herbicide and stuff, this might be a good way to get them involved or interested. Um, or like I was saying, if you have a large area that you just don't quite have the plan for, this would be a good way to just kind of stunt them and uh, keep them at bay. So we talked about a little bit of the different types of control. And so I think, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the most important thing you can do, no matter the size of your property or what you're dealing with is monitoring the site. That's the biggest mistake I see from people, even people in my industry, where you go and you do your treatment, you do your spraying, you do your mowing, you do your polling, whatever it may be. And then they don't come back and check it for a year. And so they come back and boom, there's a whole nother new species there. They didn't get a bunch of them because they came up later in the season because a lot of plants, they may um, throw up a rosette all the way in fall and you wouldn't even know it was there if you went and did treatments in the spring. And so really having that monitoring cycle and keeping an eye on the property is super important. But not only that, you have to determine what's your goal. So some of you may have livestock, some of you, um, some of you have, may have livestock, some of you may have forest land, maybe you have uh, wildlife that you're trying to rehabilitate. And so that's gonna ultimately determine what species you want there and, and what abundance. Um, and that's gonna help you determine your acceptable limits. So if you had, let's say, tansy ragwort, which is uh, poisonous for livestock, you might want none of that in the property. 
But if you're in an area where you're not having uh, livestock go out there or you're not bailing it for hay or something, maybe having a couple plants here and there isn't the end of the world. Although you do want to control them, you know, that's kind of how you're going to gauge what's, what's important, what you need to go for, because there's 154 listed noxious weeds currently. Um, and so you've really had to prioritize what you're trying to do, make sure you're following the laws and controlling the weeds you have to, um, but we can't get them all. So just knowing that acceptable limit is helpful for you as a landowner. And then from that, you kind of just design your plan. And whether you do multiple treatments throughout the year, um, what have you, just make sure that you may need, you may need to revegetate the area to get the desired species started. Um, some, a lot of people just, like I said, go out and spray something, they get rid of the weed, which is great, but then they don't take the time to establish a new species because then they'll just kind of be chasing their tail every year. So heavy seeding, fertilizing after you control some species is very, very recommended. All right, so I got through all the legal mumbo jumbo and everything, but uh, now I'm going to get into some specific noxious weed species. <clears throat> so I kind of cut and paste from some other, other presentations, so you'll see a transition as far as the, uh, the design, but don't worry about that. Um, and now I'm not quite sure what kind of demographic I'm talking to. I'm assuming some of you are uh, maybe new property owners, maybe some, a couple of you might have a farm you're looking at, maybe some of you have some forestry land. So I just tried to kind of cover a kind of a little more wide breadth of a species. So like I said, there's 154 listed weeds right now, and there's plenty of weeds beyond our list. And so I only had time for about 30 plants. And so I'll try to go through those. And if you have any specific plants or uh, and if you need me to identify, any plants, I'm more than happy to help you out with that. You can email me after the class and I can, you know, start up a cor correspondence with you. And we can try to figure out what, what plants you have and kind of how to control them. Um, and I just want to clarify, you want me to end at about 730? Is that my timeline I'm at right now? Just uh, then he has a half an hour to finish his presentation. Just to clarify, make sure I'm on time. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll just jump into it. So this is one of our new uh, introductions to the county, or at least it's sort of new to me and new, new to our group here, um, but garlic mustard. So some of you may have heard this, but I, I'm going to doubt that you have. It's kind of new. So a class A noxious weed means it's very, very rare and of the highest importance to get rid of. So that means anytime we find this, we want to get rid of it. So if you look at that picture on the bottom right, that's actually from a forest area up on um, South Skagit Highway. And so we detected it alongside the road. Um, and we saw those top two pictures where it's in those kind of rosette first year growth stage. Um, and I didn't quite know what it was. I got a couple calls about it from some counterparts I work with. And it turns out we have a class A noxious weed in the county. And I, I get, I'm assuming you're trying to wonder why it's called garlic mustard. So actually, if you smash up the plant and smell it, it'll smell just like garlic. Um, and it actually makes a very good pesto. But the big issue with that is it has some, what we call uh, alle alleopathy or allopathy. And so essentially it'll send out some chemicals through its roots and it won't let anything else grow next to it and germinate. And so if you see in that bottom right picture, it's completely dominated the understory of the forest. And so it's a big issue for forestry people, um, especially in new planting areas, um, because any new germination of that second layer, the, the forest floor area will be completely dominated and there won't be a diversity of species uh, in the understory of the forest. It's not poisonous necessarily, it is edible. Um, yeah, elk like it a lot, they eat it, move around in it. Uh, but the main concern here is the forestry industry for this plant. Um, like I said, it is a class A, it's a mustard. Um, and I'm not sure if it'll cross pollinate with our mustard crop species. I believe it might, um, but it is a biennial. You can see the first year growth there, like I said, um, but it can end up being a short lived perennial as well. Um, we have a lot of garlic seed industry in our county. It's very important for us economically. And so we really wanna get after these and other garlic species to make sure they're not affecting those industries. <clears throat> Um, and additionally, so I'll talk a tiny bit about control, I apologize. 
Um, you can go through and pull if it's just a couple, but it has this J root, uh, what, what we call a J root, and it often fr uh, fragments in the soil and will regrow. Additionally, the seed pods are explosive, or if you rub up against them, they will burst, um, and they're very small, and they get stuck in hair very easily, and so it just spreads very, very easily. So a lot of times we don't recommend walking through it if it's flowered, uh, especially, or, or has seed material, because you will spread it around, and a lot of times for this we'll just use as just your maybe your your guys of sake I'll just use the general uh, roundup or glyphosate it's very very general herbicide for this uh, it's a non-selective um, but this is one we really want to get after because it is super rare in our county um, I wouldn't recommend pulling it or mowing it not not a, not effective you'll just spread it old man's beard um, so maybe some of you upriver may have uh, more of this. So this will grow on trees very similar to English ivy. But the big difference that I would say between this is if you look in that bottom right picture, there's not a distinct cambrium like there is with uh, English ivy. So if you cut an English ivy, there'll be a very clear growth, growth ring and a dead center part to it. So it's very susceptible to uh, um, any sort of stem injection. We have a couple, we have this tool called an EasyJect lance, which has a 22 shell with uh, a wax capsule in it with herbicide. So it's not spraying or anything. Uh, it's not susceptible to that at all. Um, you can girdle it off the tree and it'll kill everything above the tree. Um, but it's a very, very aggressive viney species and it can cause, you can see the picture there in the middle, that's one of our seasonal employees, Jacob. Um, but it puts a lot of weight on these trees, especially alder, um, cottonwood, anything like that. And it can cause some serious um, hazards as far as windfall or anything. So if you have this growing on a tree next to your house, make sure you're getting rid of it because it's going to potentially cause some property damage in the long term. Um, but generally speaking, it's not the hardest thing to get rid of. You can spray foliarly on the leaves, but generally in the tree, you're just going to girdle it. And then anything on the ground, you can grub up um, if you need to. But once again, at a certain scale, you might need to do some herbicide treatments to start. Um, this is a class C. Um, so it is on the lowest part of the list. But like I said, if it's in a point where it's going to potentially cause some damage or a dangerous situation, you definitely want to uh, get after it and control it. And it is a perennial, so it just grows forever. It's great. <laughs> All right, so this is very, or I would say very rare in the county. I only know of two plants that I found near Anacortes, kind of the Sharps Corner area. Um, there's a lot more out on San Juan County, out in some of the islands out there, but this is essentially scotch broom. But if you look at that picture in the middle, it's got very long, brutal thorns. Um, and it's, it's a nasty, nasty plant and you're going to know when you find it because it's going to stab you and poke you and it's just a really, really nasty plant. But it grows in the same environments like scotch broom and it grows similarly and it takes over areas. Um, its seed is uh, very, uh, um, uh, uh, how to say, it lasts a very long time in the soil and it survives a long time. Um, so you don't want to get this established. It'll take about 30 years or so for that seed to not be viable. So get rid of this the second you find it. Um, generally speaking, you could just pull it out and it'll control it just fine. It might be a little bit hard to pull just because of the thorns and everything. Um, and so you might just spray this with like a triclopure is really good for this type of plant, um, uh, which would be like a vast slam or a garlon, something like that. Um, you can use other things, but generally speaking, that's what I would use for this plant. Um, it's really hard to pull. Unlike scotch broom, you might just do a cut stump application or just pull out the plant completely. Uh, this is just very hard to grab. All right, butterfly bush. So uh, this is probably in a, a couple of your backyards and it's okay, um, but it does escape and it takes over our rivers really bad. And our sandbars, it does really well. It has a very nice taproot that can do well in those elevated, well-drained soils, the big substrate. Um, and it absolutely takes over riverbanks. And so you see us pictures of pulling them. Um, a lot of times what I advise people, they still like the plant, is you need to go and cut and bag all the seeds uh, before they seed. So you might be able to get a little bit of flower, but then, um, you know, maybe a day after they flower, go ahead and cut them all down. And you can still have the plant, but generally speaking, we want to get rid of this whenever we can. There are some uh, sterile uh, uh, hybrids now that they sell in the nurseries, and so that's a good alternative. Um, but it's just one of those ones that runs away on you. So. Okay, and now we have English ivy. I'm sure plenty of you have this. Very easy to control. 
Um, although it is a lot of work, relatively speaking, you don't have to use chemicals if you don't want to for this one, though, which is good. Um, you can see the picture on the left, uh, just the extra weight really broke that. Uh, I think it might have been a cottonwood tree there, and it was a little older anyways, but it can cause the same, same issues as before. Um, girdle it around the tree, cut all those stems, and you don't have to pull anything above you because there could be a lot of weight and you don't want to be under that. So just let it naturally fall. Um, once you girdle it around, all that stuff up there will fall and die. And then anything down on the ground, you can kind of grub that up if you need. Uh, but sometimes on the ground stuff, you might need a little bit of herbicide depending on how much you're dealing with. But if you just have a little bit, you can grub it out and just be consistent year after year and you can get rid of it. It's just a lot of manual, manual work. So it is a class C and it's not actually required for control. And that's something I should specify too, is anything that's a C is typically not required for control, but A's and B's typically are. So you don't have to get rid of this, but once it starts causing property damage, it can cause some liability for you as a landowner, if it, especially if it lands on your neighbor's property or anything. So keep that in mind. All right, so this is kind of a unique one. Um, so this is actually near um, the Bayview Cemetery. I'm not sure if you guys know where that is, but this is actually shiny geranium, uh, not the middle top picture, but uh, the left and the right and the bottom left there, that's shiny geranium. And so it's a very, very prolific uh, seed producer. It's got the exploding seeds. Um, it, it creeps along the ground and everything and very hard to control. But once again, this takes over the understory. Um, we have quite a bit in the county, but if you're dealing with it at your place, um, and this might be, this is most definitely something that you're going to have to use herbicide, unfortunately. Um, you can go through and pull it all, but the likelihood you're going to get all the seeds and not spread it around is almost to zero. Um, it's not quite as easy to get rid of. You see that middle picture in the top. That's actually, I believe, um, Stinky Bob or Herb Robert. It's a little easier to get rid of because it's not as bad as far as seed and uh, the rhizomes. Uh, it's pretty easy to pull out of the ground, but shiny geranium can just absolutely take over, especially if you're mowing. So if you see anything like this with that purple flower, it's got this glossy leaf on it. Um, kind of almost, you, you might, if you just looked at it and think it's a clover, uh, if you're mowing your lawn or anything, make sure you're not going into this stuff because you'll spread it around and it'll, it has the same issue where it puts out those uh, chemicals in the soil and it won't let anything germinate next to it. So it won't let your grasses produce, it won't let any of your seeds produce. So, yeah. All right. So this one's a little bit... Um, uh, let more rare hound's tongue. It's not as a bit much of an issue unless you have livestock because it is toxic to livestock. It is a class B, um, but this is one of those ones you see that bottom uh, middle picture. That's the rosette stage. So if you see anything like that, it's probably a good thing to get rid of. Um, but then once it grows up and has those flowers and everything um, and it produces a seed, that's where you have the problem. Uh, this is mainly going to be an issue if you're baling hay or anything like that for your livestock. So just keep this in mind. There's a couple other um, uh, similar plants in the same family um, that are also toxic. Um, and so you see anything like this, you always try to get in that rosette stage. Um, it's a biannual. Um, let's see, generally speaking, uh, you can clip, um, clip and get rid of the seed heads and I'll get rid of the seed production. Um, and then uh, cultivation of the young rosettes in autumn or early spring can help uh, be effective in control. So once again, when it's in the rosette stage, you can control it. But once you're past there, you might just be spreading the plant around. So biennial, uh, cut and bag the seeds. And as far as herbicides, so this is where the, the slice change a little bit, but uh, you can use a broadly selective in hay fields. That's what we would use. So anything like 2,4-D, low volatile ester, so it doesn't uh, fume. Um, and then you can also use amino, amino, amino cyclopyrrolid. Um, but generally speaking, as far as herbicides, if you know what plant you have, I just recommend going and talking to your local herbicide specialist. You know, in our county, it'd probably be Farmer Supply and uh, Wilbur Ellis. Um, you can go to Home Depot, Ace Hardware, all those places, and they'll have what you need, but they may not have that, that technical knowledge that you might want. Um, and also, if you have any other chemical advice, I can talk to you after this, but you can kind of get lost up in the weeds, as we say, with that. So. <clears throat> All right, so this is another agriculture more base weed issue. Uh, it's an annual herbaceous um, and it is toxic for livestock. Um, so you wanna make checking your hay or anything like that for this, 
Generally speaking, this is going to be an issue out in your crop fields where you have a lot of that disturbed soil right next to hedgerows, anything like that. Um, same thing as before, you can use a, a, a broadleaf selective herbicide, generally speaking, um, and then early tillage in the spring can help knock this back and keep it from seeding, and then you can get your crop or your established or your desired species um, started. Um, and this is one of these special ones where if you actually treat it with herbicide and you have livestock out there, they can actually, it increases the palatability and, um, and create a specific smell that may make them want to eat it. And that's something you want to avoid as well. I'm just going to look at this. Um, the questions real quick and answer these. Um, are there some thistles native to our area? Very good question. Um, are, they, are they all noxious weed? Um, it seems butterflies really like them. That's a very good question. So there are native thistles, uh, surprisingly enough. Um, I'd say, generally speaking, the native ones are not the ones you're looking at. The most common ones, thistle species <clears throat> in the county that you're dealing with is Canada thistle, bull thistle. Um, that's, I mean, large, large majority of the thistles that you're going to see in our county are those, but there are native thistles. Um, and so keep that in mind when you're identifying them or, or you need a help identifying the thistles. I'll, I have a slide or two, I think, on some thistles going down the road here. Um, I have something that looks like that, but I'm not sure. Is that the same? Is there something, is there something looking similar? So less, I didn't get, get it on the right side. Oh, I was referring to garlic mustard. Um, so there's a native field mustard. It has a yellow flower. Um, if you have garlic mustard, you let me know because I will come and help you get rid of that. Um, that's that's a hundred percent a priority, and you can even just send me a picture. But if it has a white flower, it's growing just like a mustard, and maybe at the early stages, I call them sand dollars. That leaf looks almost perfectly circular, very little um, serrations around the leaf. But once it grows that stalk with the white flower, um, it'll ha start having a more point on the leaf or a, a more um, exacerbated uh, 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 point to the leaf. Um, but yes, if you have any pictures, um, horse tail and flower beds. <laughs> oh, horse tail. We're getting there, you guys. We're getting there. Um, Okay, just yeah, send me a picture and then um, they turn somewhat purple. Very interesting. Yeah, send me a picture. We try to keep that out and I'll get the horse tail in a second. So let's get to poison head one. Let's keep going. I want to be cautious about the time here. So um, there's a couple lookalikes that you need to be aware of. So if you look in the back there, that is what poison hemlock looks like in the first year. Obviously, there's some dead canes in the back, but that's what it's going to look like right now. So if you went out in the out, on the road, you're going to see some of this alongside the road, and right now is the time to spray it. If you're going to spray, also the, the soil is still moist and you can pull them out of the ground. Um, so there are some lookalikes though. So the left there, that is poison hemlock. You can see the, po the purple splotching on the stem, that's very key. Um, and then the umbel, the white flower on the top. Um, it's a little bit harder just from that picture, but uh, one that's ob or, uh, commonly confused with it is Queen Anne's lace. And the big one with this is obviously the leaf is a little bit different, but that's not as obvious. Uh, it doesn't have purple splotching. The stem is somewhat hairy. You can see that in that picture. But really, I want you to look at those umbels. So Queen Anne's lace is very, very specific. It'll actually close up like a cup uh, at, in the morning and night. So uh, poison hemlock doesn't fully do that. Um, uh, um, cow parsnip and giant hogweed does a little bit but not to the same extent when you see queen ants lace you'll see it in, at the night time in the morning it'll be completely closed like a cup uh, it's very cool very unique and then it'll open up throughout the day um but all of these are poisonous but poison hemlock is a listed noxious weed a uh, queen ants lace is a native plant and then on the right side there we have water hemlock and the big thing with this It'll it doesn't have the splotching, but it'll have that pink redness or purplish purple in the stem, but it's not splotchy. And then the leaf is very different. You can see it's much more just like a general plant, elongated lobe leaves, um, versus the the poison hemlock or the queen anne's lace almost has what I would call in layman's terms a uh, uh, a more fern-like leaf. Um, big key differences, but all of them are poisonous. And so if you have them incorporated in hay feed or anything like that, or in hay fields, you want to get rid of it because it will kill your animals. Um, and it can also give you rashes for handling it. And technically that's what Socrates drank in his tea that killed him. So 
It's a biannual, like I was saying earlier, it has that rosette stage, that first uh, low to the ground growth. Once it starts sending up the stock, it has way less leaves and it's a lot harder to control. At that point, you're just pulling it out, cutting, bagging seed heads, trying to get that whole taproot out. Um, and any herbicide at a full grown plant with flower is not very effective. It can be, but you're spraying a lot more of the ground because there's not a lot of leaf to grab it. Whereas if you sprayed it in that earlier picture, you're getting a lot of leaf cover and it's very effective that way. Um, 2,4-D triclopyr, um, lots of different chemicals work with this, but if it's in grass fields, you want a broadleaf selective, that's very helpful so it won't burn the grass um, and it'll make it so you don't have to maybe seed as much. Whereas if you did a non-selective, um, you're gonna have to go through and seed, otherwise other things are gonna come in there. And you're dealing with about a two to five year seed life with this plant. Um, class B, it is toxic and is required for control. Common groundsel, so I'm sure you guys have seen this around. Uh, once again, this is poisonous, but it is a biannual. Um, it's not as big of an issue unless you're doing crop fields or some sort of crop, uh, uh, row crop, um, because generally speaking, it's not going to establish very well in yards that are maintained and well, well built, uh, anything like that. And then the forest is not really as big of a deal, but you can see in the top right picture, it's much that's got that kind of clay soils that are, are commonly um, plowed or, or put into row crops, that's where you're going to have a big issue with this. It is a class C and it's not required for control. Um, you know, 2,4-D, um, anything like that is broadly selective. Um, but uh, there is a moth as well that goes after this, but once again, carrying capacity is an issue, um, but it produces by seed mostly. It's got that kind of dandelion, hawkweed um, type of seed head that will turn into that white tuff and, and blow in the wind. <clears throat> All right, St. John's wort. Uh, so this is, you're gonna see a lot alongside roads, um, kind of bad soil areas, um, but it can go kind of just about anywhere. Um, it is a, cl a class C, it's a perennial herbaceous, herbaceous, so it'll kind of be there throughout the year, but it may only bloom certain times of the year. Uh, you can pull them as long as you make sure you get all the lateral roots. So this is one of those ones where it'll have its, uh, um, the, the original plant and then it'll have lateral roots going out and it'll send up a new plant and it'll keep doing that. And so once you get, once you let it go too far, you can get those bottom two pictures where it just takes over a whole entire field. And at that point, um, you're most likely just going to uh, uh, either do a chemical treatment and then till the whole entire area and then reseed um, or a combination of those in some, some regard. So once you see it, get rid of it. You're going to see it maybe on the sides of your driveway alongside uh, I-5, stuff like that, Highway 20. Um, but if you have established grasses and um, it's not overgrazed or anything, you shouldn't have much of a problem with this. Um, there are some beetles that go after it. Uh, so this is one of those ones, pasture management of bare soils prevents infestation. So you might hear this a lot. I, I talk with the WSU Extension Office and I always try to tell them just don't overgraze your property and you're not going to have a lot of these issues because the grass is so competitive, typically speaking, it's not going to let us, a lot of stuff grow there unless it's overgrazed. Um, and then also it's got a rosette stage and you want to try to treat it at that stage if possible because once it's at the flower, once again, it decreases leaf abundance. It puts all of its energy into its flower or its seeds. Okay, so this is probably the number one concern as far as livestock um, in the county, Tansy Ragwort. So this is a property, I won't say where necessarily, but it's in the county, um, got a call that they had some animals die. And what happened is they let them out to a field uh, below this and they mowed the whole property the day before and they didn't know that tansy ragwort was in there. So when all the animals went down there and started eating it and they had a couple animals die. Um, and it's a very violent death. It's not the greatest. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, the big distinguisher for this between common tansy and tansy ragwort, if you look at the bottom right picture, it has that bunch flower in the middle, but it also has individual uh, uh, petals around the outside. The common tansy will just have that bunch flower, what, or what we call a button flower. Um, if you look at the bottom left, that's what a rosette looks like. It's kind of a 
really shriveled up, um, kind of like smashed up wrapping paper, I would say, like a, a romaine lettuce almost. Um, but it, that's its rosette stage, its first year growth. And then once it gets to this yellow stage, it'll eventually turn into a white or a tuff that'll just blow in the wind and it spreads. The seed's very viable. Um, if this is in your hay, it's going to poison the animals. Uh, you might get some acute toxicity. Um, but also you can get it if you're, you're picking it by your hands, people can uh, develop some rashes as well. So keep that in mind. It is a class B, it's required for control, spread by seed, biannual. So you wanna get it in that, <clears throat> sorry, that rosette stage. Um, there are some bugs for it, but generally speaking, don't overgraze your property like that property in that picture. You can see it's obviously overgrazed. Um, and if it is overgrazed, you're going to need to go and get rid of all these plants because otherwise all that seed's just going to move farther and farther and farther and take over that whole spot. Um, yeah, in general speaking, 2,4-D if it's in the grass, um, you can hand pull individual plants and that's pretty effective. But once the soil gets hard, it's going to be really hard to pull that out. I'm gonna speed up just a tiny bit, make sure I have time for questions. So there's a lot of knapweed species in the county. Uh, there's Russian knapweed, meadow knapweed, um, all sorts of diffuse knapweed. Generally speaking with the knapweed, if you look in that bottom right picture, it almost looks like a thistle, but it has um, these kind of spiny, uh, what do I call them? Uh, leaflets or, or what have you, uh, they don't have thorns. And so the flower might look like a, uh, a thistle, but it doesn't have the thorns. Um, there are some bugs that'll go after it, but the big issue is that top right picture, it'll send out those roots and shoot up, send out, shoot up, and it'll eventually take over whole entire properties. And at that point, you might have to do some chemical control. Um, so it's a perennial, it'll grow continuously, whether it's a, the actual plant or its root systems that's kind of crawling along. Um, you Fertilizer is a potential option for this. And so some of these, um, uh, uh, if you change the pH uh, or if you fertilize with a seed um, in conjunction with our herbicide, it can help a lot. Um, there's a nematode that'll go after this. Once again, um, your carrying capacity issues, but 2,4-D mixed with milestones is really helpful. I don't think 2,4-D works really well alone on this because of those lateral roots. And uh, if they fragment and then the seeds in the soil, um, the 2,4-D isn't good enough to treat that alone. You need to have that milestone for that ground activity to get rid of those seeds. Uh, but for this, if you're at that stage where you have to use herbicides, you might be at a stage where you're kind of taking the landscape approach. You're knocking it back and you're coming back either tilling it up with and putting in fertilizers and seeds to redo everything. Um, uh, uh, but a lot of you may not have that ability and you might just have to spot treat and, and do it like that. Okay, common teasel, very common in the Anacortis area, kind of Bayview area, um, uh, kind of up there by pet car, stuff like that. It's very common up there. Um, it's not as big of an issue in some other parts of the county, but it can take over your property really bad. It's a prolific seed producer. You can see how bunched those rosettes are. The cool thing about these rosettes is if you feel these leaves at the rosette stage, it'll have the spines on the back of the main stem. Um, and then on the edges of the leaves, it'll have spines as well. And there's nothing else that I know of in this area that'll have that. So if you see rosettes similar to that, and you feel along them and it has spines inside the leaf on the edges on the back side of the main um, vein in the stem, it's definitely teasel. And you can see those rosettes on the bottom right or in this big picture uh, in the background, they grow very large and they have very long spines. You can see it on the leaf there. Um, pretty flower, um, but for this, generally speaking, it's not required for control. Um, the best thing to do would be mowing frequently to prevent the new seed to start off. You don't want those shoots to start because then you're just, you're not gonna be having a good time. You're chasing the seed set. Um, glyphosate works good for spot spraying. A lot of times it's gonna be on gravel a lot or ditch banks. Um, it doesn't do very well in open fields. It's hard to compete with it, but it will eventually take them over. Um, and at that point you're dealing with a 2,4-D milestone or a non-selective like glyphosate or mazepure. But once again, you're gonna have a bald spot that you're gonna have to revegetate. Um, you can pull these out individually, but they're really spiny. And so if there's a bunch of them that might not be a practical solution for you. 
milk thistle. I think it's pretty rare here. It is a class A, that's, that's why, um, but it's a biennial. It's got that rosette stage, very similar to all the rest of the thistles, but the big characteristic for this is that milky stem on, or the milky leaf on the bottom right. And then also the flower itself, instead of having those little tiny spikes, it has very elongated thorns on the flower head. Unlike the, the bull thistle I'm, I showed earlier, it has very small, well-bunched, um, uh, um, uh, uh, thorns coming off the flower versus this is much more larger and robust, but milky, milky veins in the, in the leaf. Um, you can pull out the young plants. Uh, once again, if you're able to, um, during rosette and bolting stage, you can do post-emergent treatments. Uh, I'm sure as well in, in the rosette stage before it flowers, cultivation continually might be able to help as well. Uh, but you do not want to do any mowing or cultivation once it has flower or you're just going to spread the plant. All right, so Canada thistle. Um, so good, I really like that question of the native thistles. Um, I don't have the native thistles on my slides, unfortunately, but it's good to note and maybe take a sample and go through and maybe key it out or send it to someone that can help you with that. It's very important. Um, but this is very common for common uh, for Canada thistle. You see the field in the background there. Um, each one of those uh, sections is essentially one plant. Uh, they've just been cloning itself over time. And I'm sure some of them are different plants, um, technically speaking, but it does clone itself and it'll send out new shoots and clone and clone until it gets larger and larger. So once you get to a field this size, you do not want to do any work at all once it's flowered because you're just going to make it worse. You have to go in before and mow it down before it gets the seed. Um, if you just want to keep it at bay, it'll still grow and clone itself. But generally speaking, you're going to have to do a chem chemical approach for these. Any tilling or anything is just going to make everything way worse. We've seen people go through and till, saying that it was going to be fine. And then instead of 20 or 30% of the property being covered and stuff, it was almost 100% Canada thistle. So if you do have Canada thistle, you more than likely are going to have to spray it um, unless it's just a couple plants. Um, unlike bull thistle, it has a taproot and it's a biannual uh, that doesn't clone. You can just pull those out and a couple other species, but the Canada thistle, that's not, it's not, not the way to go. Um, you want to combine treatments, broadleaf uh, selectives the best typically because it's mostly going to be in grass fields. Um, once you do that, if you do a uh, um, non-selective, you're going to kill everything, and then the seed that's in the soil is going to take over those bald areas. So broadleaf selective is very helpful for this. All right, bull thistle. So like I was saying earlier in the bottom left picture, you can see how those thorns are, are the, yeah, yeah I just call them thorns, uh, are much more dense and a little smaller, but um, sharp, uh, unlike the milk thistles, very robust thorns. Um, you see the bottom right there, that's what the rosette looks like. Um, so a lot of these uh, thistle rosettes are gonna be pretty similar, but you'll know when you have a bull thistle rosette, because if you see the picture in the background, it has those, Instead of open flat leaves, kind of like the Canada thistle will have, it has very pointed um, with spikes on it, leaf, leaves, and uh, they're not very pronounced as far as the leaf. Um, whereas the other thistles, they have pretty large leaf, leaf area associated with it. These, you can just pull them out and you can pull out and get that taproot out. Um, you don't necessarily have to use herbicide, but it, once again, at a certain scale, then that might be the thing to do. Biannual, produces by seed. 2,4-D is really the way to go. You can use some tricopier, which is that uh, vast land. Um, and milestone is very helpful if there's already seed established in the ground. Um, but a lot of times you don't want to use milestone too much um, in, in uh, um, sensitive areas. Uh, you can use it in hay fields. Um, but a lot of times if you want um, a little less of a kill in the area and less work to replant. You might just want to stick with the 2,4-D or vast land. Um, there are some insects as well that'll go after it, but we can talk about those another time. And you got about 15 more minutes. So I'm just gonna get through, got about 10 slides. Just uh, bear with me. Italian arum, very hard to get rid of. You see that picture on the right? Um, completely takes over areas. There's some areas out there in Bow, uh, Burlington that have quite a bit of this. Um, it'll send up these kind of fruit-like um, flowers um, and they're, it's very poisonous um, and you, any of the sap can give you rashes, but it'll have those milky sims, very waxy, almost like um, English ivy. 
Um, but this, the problem with this has a lot of tubers and it fragments in the soil. So herbicide alone won't be affected. So you'll have to do a combination of herbicide and sifting through your soil to get those, those tubers. Um, and if you just do um, sifting through the soil, you're gonna do a lot more work than if you just did a little bit of herbicide to begin with, maybe the season before. Um, very hard to control because those tubers are disconnected from the root, so it doesn't translocate through them. So if you have this, you may be in a situation where you have to get rid of the soil and all the substrate there and re redo everything. Um, but from my experience, I've done a couple of treatments um, with a non-selective herbicide, so it'll kill everything that it touches as far as green material. Um, and then going through the soil once everything's dead and raking everything up and literally collecting all the tubers that I could find and just repeat that process and get rid of it after a while. But kind of an expensive one as far as uh, um, removing soil to get rid of. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of spurges or maybe I just have one, but nonetheless, there are some spurges. Uh, they're toxic for livestock as well. It's gonna affect your grass fields. Uh, if you break that stem on the top left, it'll have a milky sap and I believe all the spurges will. There's egg leaf spurge, leafy spurge, um, myrtle spurge, there's a couple of um, um, uh, spurge laurel. That's a little different, but still, it, it still applies. Um, all of them are noxious weeds. Um, you should probably get rid of them if you have them. I had a kid uh, a couple of years ago who uh, ate some of this milk sap at the bus stop. Um, and their parents called me because their kid was in the hospital and couldn't breathe. Um, they found out from his friend that he was eating some plant at the bus stop and we had to go and figure it out. And it turns out that it was this plant right here, the leafy spurge that the kid was playing with and it actually shut his throat and he couldn't breathe. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, it is perennial, it spreads by seed and rhizomes. Um, and typically mowing can keep the seed production down. Um, you generally speaking are probably going to use a, uh, um, uh, some sort of broadleaf selective herbicide in grass fields or non-selective, but you need to get it early before it gets very fibrous and woody, um, because the stem, I don't know if I have a good picture of it, um, it gets pretty thick and woody, especially at the base. So you want to get it young while it's still pretty susceptible and, um, uh, Right, policeman's helmet. <clears throat> uh, so I don't have a ton on this, but it's very easy to control. Like we talked about it before a tiny bit. This is what the flower looks like, very pretty, but it's got these projectile seed heads. But if you look on the left, the roots are very shallow. It doesn't, um, it only reproduces by seed. So once you pull it out or mow it before it flowers, it's controlled. So it's a very fun one to get rid of, very satisfying, but it can take over areas very quickly if you let it go to seed multiple times. Uh, a lot of this up near Day Creek and upriver all the way up to Marble Mount um, and a lot over near um, the Sock, Concrete Sock Valley Road area as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, perennial pepperweed, another weed that's uh, starting to show up here with class B. I really only see it out on the Swinomish Channel area on a couple of the islands. Uh, it's going to be a big issue for your drier soils, but it can be growing in brackish waters. Uh, not a huge one you guys need to worry about, so I'm just going to kind of keep going through. Reed canary grass. Um, you guys are going to deal with this at probably all of your properties, especially if you're near any water bodies. Generally speaking, uh, it'll create these mats that can cause a problem long term for your soils um, and allow nothing else to grow there, especially if no grazing animals are present to keep it at bay. Uh, in the bottom left picture, that's a planting area. And generally speaking, you're going to have to mow it or chemically mow it um, to keep it down while your trees are planting. So that way it can eventually shade out the area. That's the best control we have for long term. Um, currently, um, but really that's one of those cultural things where you're just being the predator for a while until those trees get mature and they can eventually start shading out those areas. Um, not weed, you're gonna have a big issue in the county. Um, it's very hard to get rid of. You're gonna have to spray it. Give me a call. We have a grant for it, but it looks essentially like bamboo and takes over our rivers. So I'll just kind of keep going through. I just wanna be cautious of time here. Purple loose strife, uh, if you have any water bodies, lakes, streams, anything like that, uh, it's gonna be a problem, about 2.4 million seeds per double plant. Uh, it's in the mint family, family, so we'll have that square stem. Uh, it's out there in Fur Island, out in the Tidelands, and then some areas out in Cedrawoli and some water bodies um, out, out in the Cedrawoli area. So uh, you don't want that bottom middle picture. That's just a uh, water body, essentially, that's 100% taken over. Um, so if you do see it, get after it early, and maybe what you can do is just cut the seed heads every year just to keep it from, uh, 
producing more, um, but it's very prolific seed producer. Um, and aquatic application is typically needed, so you might need specialty herbicides. So you can give me a call and then we can talk about that. Uh, blackberry, you guys are dealing with this. Largely what I do for this is you can treat the giant thicket if you want to with herbicide, but what I prefer is mowing it down with equipment. So it's about two feet off the ground and then either cutting stump and treating the hearts, grubbing out the hearts by hand or spraying it at that two foot level. So you use less herbicide, uh, it's much more easy to maintain and walk through. Um, and then after that, you just keep up with that annual treatment and then eventually switch to a broadleaf selective. And then your grasses or whatever species you're trying to establish can have a chance. But a lot of times you'd have to do some manual, manual control for a while to keep it at bay to get what you need established. Um, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> um, yep. Giant hogweed. So this is one, this, uh, we only have two known populations, one in Siege Woolly and one in Anacortis. This will cause third degree burns essentially on your skin and it'll scar you for six years, six to 20 years, essentially. Um, it grows about 20 feet tall. It looks like our native cow parsnip, but the umbel you see in that left picture is about three feet to four feet wide. And that leaf is probably five to six feet wide, just to give you reference. Um, very giant, giant plant. Um, and I don't recommend touching it. I only do chemical treatments just because of the human safety aspect. Perennial produces by seed. Um, Scotch broom, talked about this a little bit. Prescribed burning is actually pretty effective getting rid of this. I'm sure you guys see this all around. Uh, pulling out the plant itself could be helpful, except for it can destabilize some so or some so uh, the soil, depending on if you're on the incline or something. So you have to be aware you think about that. You can do cut stump as well, and there are some insects that work pretty well with this. Um, but it, once again, it's got a 30 year life cycle. So as far as the seed, um, and so just keep up with it and you're gonna keep dealing with seedlings, but as long as you get rid of those big seed producing plants, you're, you're good. Um, you just have to keep up with those little babies that come up. Morning Glory, um, this is one, if you have it, it's a very beautiful plant. Do not mow it. Do If it's in your lawn, you're going to have to quarantine that part of your lawn if you want to get rid of it. And you're probably going to have to do an herbicide treatment to get rid of it and then reseed that area of your lawn. I have a couple landowners in Burlington that had this and they kept mowing it and then it was all over the whole entire property. Um, so if you see this plant, it's okay, I guess, if you have it around. It's classy. It's not required for control. But if it's in your lawn and you're mowing it, it's going to be a problem long term. Um, it grows up on trees and bushes and can overgrow things. And that's a whole other thing, just like ivy. So that's another concern. But generally speaking, herbicide is needed for this just because of how, how it spreads vegetatively with fragmentation in, in the seeds. Um, so uh, I got a couple links here, very helpful. Uh, if you just Google the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board, it has a big old page with all these noxious weed information. It has like color code, it has a plant key you could use, and then you could also get publications and then get some more just general plant information. Um, if you look at the Pacific Northwest handbooks.org, it has chemical information on every single plant you can think of, as well as insect information. And so if you want any scientific information on chemicals or what to use, rates, anything like that, that's the place to go. Um, it really has everything you need if, if you just want to search it yourself. So Pacific Northwest handbooks.org. Um, and you can choose between plants, pesticides, uh, insects, and diseases. So it has all that stuff you can look at. So if you're really interested, you can, you can go for it. Um, the other ones aren't as important for our current conversation, but we made it. <laughs> I'm going to look at the chat box real quick and make sure I can look up. So how do you get rid of buttercup? Um, so, so there's a couple different uh, creeping buttercup. Uh, let's say it's in an ag field uh, or a grass field. A lot of times you're going to use a 2,4-D chemical or triclopure mixed with a milestone. Um, sometimes, uh, depending on your scale, uh, liming or changing the pH of the soil can help. It just depends on your soil. Uh, we've done that at our farm before, and that helps. Uh, the large part of it is you just, you don't, uh, it spreads by those rhizomes. Um, and so you don't really, um, I believe cultivation can help it a little bit, but it can spread it as well. Um, but you really have to go through with broadleaf herbicide, unfortunately, at a large scale. At a small scale, you might be able to pull it up. 
but I use a chemical called Milestone with Vaseline, B-A-S-D-L-A-N, and that's a triclopyr, or you could use 2,4-D with Milestone, and that works really well, and that'll actually go after your clovers as well, um, but generally speaking, that's for like a hay environment. Um, not a good, a lot of good options for buttercup, unfortunately. Uh, the biggest thing is don't overgraze your property um, and it won't make it as bad. I think horse fields are probably the worst just because of the way horses browse. Um, but in your backyard, I think it could be manageable if you sectioned it off, didn't mow through that area, um, and then you sprayed a broadleaf, let those die back, and then come back and reseed. Um, is common tansy. Uh, is common ragwort okay? So it's not common ragwort, it's just common, um, uh, uh, oh yes, I guess it is common ragwort, uh, uh, common tansy, sorry, not ragwort. So it's common tansy and tansy ragwort. So common tansy is a noxious weed. It is okay. It is still toxic for livestock, but it's so woody that they're not going to eat it. You can control it pretty easily with mowing repetitively, um, and you can do some herbicide treatments as well. Um, but tansy ragwort is the one that you should be really worried about as far as toxicity and taking over land. Additionally, common tansy, it doesn't um, seed the same way. It's not necessarily as effective as tansy ragwort with the wind um, dispersal. Um, and then <laughs> looks great in dry flower arrangements. Uh, uh, maybe that's for tansy you're talking about, but a lot of these are used for dry uh, uh, flower arrangements and stuff like that. And, you know, these are all brought in for a reason. They're very pretty plants. Um, we brought them in because we like them and then they just took off because they don't have natural predators. So, um, oh, the teasel, yes. Yeah, so teasel is so common in holiday arrangements because it is really pretty and it's, it's very unique, but um, you know we don't advise that in some of these plants. You know it is uh, technically illegal to sell in arrangements, like at that quarantine law I was talking about earlier. But unfortunately, some of them, even though they are listed noxious weeds, you don't you're not required to control. Or um, sorry, you're, uh, they are noxious weeds, but they're not on the quarantine list, and that's partially because of them being Class C and abundant, and then also that economic issue as far as nurseries or um, you know. Uh, Home Depot or, or Walmart selling it in decorations and stuff, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. So, uh, oh, horsetail. So I, I think I did take that sign out. Uh, horsetail, um, yeah, not a lot of good hope for you. The only effective chemical I've used for horsetail is something we use on bare side roads. So if you're in any sort of environment like your backyard, riparian, anything like that, I wouldn't recommend it. Mostly for horsetail, unfortunately, you can't you can use 2,4-D, but the, it's so fibrous and there's no leaf area, it just doesn't take it in. And then the other thing is the root structure, they've recorded it like something crazy up to like a mile long. And it's a prehistoric plant. And so what I recommend for that is uh, potentially changing the pH of your soil can help. Uh, draining the soils a little better can help. I know it can grow in dry conditions, but generally it likes those moist ditch areas, um, things like that. So if you can maybe cut a ditch or lower the, the hydrology table a little bit, that can help. Um, and then additionally, what I do is I'll go through and mow or cut it all down because it's very early in the season, you see it, and you cut it down before it gets to that spore stage that it gets. That way you, it won't spread the spores and um, spread. But then um, uh, you're being that predator and knocking it down. So then your grasses will come up after you mowed those down and it'll keep them down and the grasses will help suppress it a little bit. But since it comes up so early, I just recommend cutting it, knocking it down before it gets to the spore stage. Um, you can spray some herbicides, but if it's in your backyard, I really don't recommend it. If it's in your driveway, then there's a couple things we can talk about. Um, but generally speaking, just knock it down, let your grasses start to get established in that late spring. And then after that, you wouldn't have to worry about it too much. Just don't let it go to spore. That's how it's gonna spread. If you're in the ag field, cut some ditches, lower that hydrology level. Um, and then uh, maybe you can go through with some lime, lime if you're able and change the pH of the soil a tiny bit. Um, but that's all I've been able to, able to do with horsetail. So, sorry. <laughs> um, and then holly. So English holly, uh, pretty easy to get rid of. Uh, it's really nasty to mess with, but if you just cut stump it, so the second you cut it, you get an herbicide and paint it around that cambrium layer, and that's gonna suck it down into all those uh, root structures in the ground. Because when you cut holly, it'll send up a bunch of uh, new stems. Uh, additionally, 
after you cut that plant, you need to elevate it off the ground because the shoots at any branch, like say you cut down the tree and it falls over, all those branches touching the ground will go into the ground and create roots and it'll stay alive and keep going. So what we've done before is we cut and then paint the herbicide around, or we have a, a stem injection gun that will put those, those capsules in it. Um, and that'll kill all the roots underneath and keep it from sending up those suckers. Uh, but then all the stuff you've cut, you need to put it on top of a tarp or some sort of structure so it won't touch the ground because otherwise it'll it'll send out roots right off of the, the tree branches. So it's, it's kind of interesting that way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I used to work WCC and there's an island right off the backside of Guaymas Island. And that's what we did because it, there was one tree, I remember going by it and it was probably 20 feet long and it was laying down sideways and every branch touching the ground was completely stuck in the ground with roots. And you could see on the other end that the stump is just cut, it's just dead, but then the whole tree just looks light, as live as ever. Um, Kind of, kind of an inter interesting plant, and there is a native holly as well. Um, but um, you know, if you need help identifying that, I can help you out. So, yeah. So I think that's uh, seven thirty-two. I'm a tiny bit over, but I hope hope that helped you guys out. And uh, if you have any questions, just you know, feel free to send me a text, uh, give me a call. You can. I have an email there as well, um, and I can help figure out what weeds you have. And if you have any specific questions, we can kind of iron out those. Um, one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me.